is a massive amount to talk about. Um, but the basic, so the basic outline what is or was that uh, we'd have these three papers, and the first one I think is really focused on integrating a lot of what you're doing with, uh, you know, morphoceuticals, electroceuticals, somatic psychiatry, uh, multi-scale competence architecture, all of this <clears throat> fantastic work that you've been doing with chemical ecology, broadly speaking. Uh, and my, you know, real area of specialization is in toxinology. So is in the study of animal toxins and, and particularly venomous organisms. But there are, of course, a lot of resonances between what you have been doing and just chemical ecology more broadly, not just toxins. Mm -hmm. And so one of the one of the things that I, that I actually teach is a is a pharmacology subject It's sort of on the human relationship with drugs. But um, I take it all the way from. Uh, from chemical ecology, basically, and then to the way that organisms find molecular tools in their environment, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> including in processes like uh, toxin sequestration, but uh, but also various symbiotic processes. And there's, uh, if we, we can talk about morphogenesis perhaps in a minute, because there's there are all these fascinating examples of uh, of, of chemically uh, well chemically mediated morphogenesis of course but between organisms right so the involvement of say symbiotic microbes in mm -hmm. morphogenesis mm -hmm. that's a seemingly really really mm -hmm. common for mar marine invertebrates in the in the larval transition from a pelagic phase so when they're just you know floating around on currents to the benthic phase where they become attached to a surface uh, it's, it's very, very common for some symbiotic bacteria to be involved in that transition, and there's a lot of a lot of work on attempting to uh, to uh, identify the the relevant uh, molecules that are involved there. Um, Amazing. Well, well, that's that's super cool, and I think I think some some um, sort of low hanging fruit there is to, is a is a, a paper on that per particularly uh, in the context of the the kind of synthetic morphology idea right that that yeah. that, that you know nature hacks each other it, itself all the time in every direction and that we as engineers should be doing that too i mean i've been getting into plant galls and it's you know these these amazing um ways that that life uh takes advantage of the competencies of of the things around it and so I think I think just that. I mean, I'd love to. I actually, I would just love to hear you talk about this stuff because I I don't know all of these examples. Um, yeah, I think it would be amazing. Yeah, galls are another really cool example, and I've 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 seen you talk about them. And uh, you know, as you as you know, right, galls are incre another incredibly widespread thing. You know, it's not just that there are these cynipid wasps that inflict galls. I mean, there's a whole fa fascinating thing with just with those wasps, though, where you've got the so-called iniquiline. Um, species which are they are essentially hyperparasites in a sense they don't make galls themselves but they steal galls or appropriate the galls of other species oh so God. there's all of that there's all of that cool stuff going on but then you know you've got aphids that make galls and beetles that make galls and and i think there's estimated to be tens or maybe even over a hundred thousand species of insect that are involved in in gall formation and then there's there's there are fungi that induce galls and all, all sorts of stuff so there's Again, a very what turn what initially looks to be really kind of exotic in a certain sense, which is one organism influencing the morphogenesis of another through some chemical mediator, turns out to be a very very common process. And that's another thing with with venom. You know, we're not necessarily talking about morphogenesis there, although there can be very um, subtle things going on, like the influence of the immune system and that sort of thing. You know, venom is not necessarily all just about killing. Um, although people differ in their in their definition of venom as well. Um, but toxins are certainly not necessarily all about killing. But again, we tend to think, oh, you know, venom is this exotic thing and uh, I've got these snakes and scorpions and spiders and whatever come to mind when people think of venomous organisms and 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 they're this very particular thing going on. But again, there's probably over 200,000, maybe more venomous organisms in the world. Venom has evolved over 100 times independently. Um, and it's just a, a particularly um, specialized form of chemical ecology. And that's just ubiquitous, right? So organisms mediating their interactions with other organisms through chemical means is just, you know, just a thing that organisms do in general. And then we get these really cool, specific examples of it. And so when I when I teach um, the human relationship with drugs to, to pharmacology students here at uh, the University of Melbourne, 
I um I try to initially demonstrate to them that pharmacology is really you know could be thought of as a subset of biology. They don't get any biology necessarily really um in the in the pharmacology stream, or they don't get an integration of pharmacology with biology, which always is kind of mind boggling to me. Um, but so I just start from from the basic principles of chemical ecology, uh, organisms mediating interactions with each other. You know, in cooperative ways, sometimes, of course, in antagonistic ways, when we're talking about toxins. And also one of the really fascinating things is the way relationships can so readily flip, the valences of relationships can flip from, say, you know, commensals become parasites or, you know, commensals become mutualists or sometimes parasites become mutualists, all of these sorts of fun things where a certain shift in in, in the context of the relationship um, or we might say a shift in the reference frames of the relationship actually, you know, has this has this profound shift in in its valence. But I, you know, I go from I go from some of these examples um, to to speaking of the chemical ecology of the human, basically, and just saying that pharmacology is essentially a you know it's you know humans do things in refined and specialized ways. Um, but it's really something that that you know organisms do in general, which is search out useful molecular tools in their environment mm. and appropriate them. And mm. just vivid examples that I use are things like toxin sequestration. So you know one organism um, appropriating the defensive toxins of another organism this is the, the most common way this happens for for their own defense. Um, and I'm wearing this you know chemical ecology uh, t-shirt. And the molecule here is the, is the backbone of a cardiac glycoside. And it's just an interesting uh, molecule because it's one of these things that's often involved or is involved in a number of different, you know, cool examples of, uh, of toxin sequestration. So like wanderer butterflies, um, the, the caterpillars feed on milkweed and they, they take these cardiac glycosides that the plant produces and they sequester them in their own tissues. And then the butterfly, which of course only feeds on on nectar, um, but retains these stored toxins, and then is a, is itself a toxic butterfly. But then in completely different sets of interactions, like uh, we've got poisonous toads, which have been a major issue here in Australia, of course, since they were introduced. The cane toad here, most of our um, frog-eating critters here in Australia are, are toad naive because we don't have native toads, mm -hmm. so they are. Um, sensitive to these cardiac glycoside toxins that the toads make um, but elsewhere in the world where there are there are specialist uh, snakes that feed on toads you get these things like tiger keelbacks which have specialized glands in their in their neck or neutral glands and they feed on the toads and they actually sequester the uh, the toad toxins into these specialized defensive glands and then they have bright orange and black bands on their necks um, aposomatic coloration to warn of the of the of the toxicity that they've basically stolen from from their environment. So there's all those kinds of things, um, and then you know some of these examples of of of, of influence of of chemical ecology and or symbioses on um, on morphogenesis in these uh, transitions is sort of uh, from from pelagic to benthic um, for marine invertebrates. That's that's again observed in like a long list of of, of different taxa, um, sponges, pinoflagellates, ascidians, worms. Uh, so it's it's a, it seems like another common thing. Arthropods that are barnacles. I think that, that this is involved with, um, and in some cases it seems like uh the the there's a direct appropriation in the sense that the the bacteria are being preyed upon and then something that the bacteria is is producing is being appropriated as part of that um process of 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 predation so in these coanoflagellates that that have both um single celled and multicellular um life stages um and I don't think they're even obligatory in terms of their transition to multicellular. So they can actually live out their lives and reproduce as single celled organisms. But there's this rosette inducing factor um, that certain bacteria produce and the kind of flagellates feed on these bacteria. And then as a result of that and getting this RIF1, uh, they end up forming these rosette like colonies of so multicellular colonies. So you get this. So that's been studied as a as a potential model system for the origins of multicellularity in some sort of symbiotic um, interaction, um, and in in a number of cases, like there are there are sponges which get um, 
you know, key molecules that they can't make themselves from bacteria that are that they're symbiotic with, and then they maybe digest them at some point in the process. Initially, they're living with them. Once they've got enough of whatever it is they need, uh, they digest them. Um, but we know that this has been a been a really important process, right, in the origin of, of eukaryotic cells and things as well, right? So you can see how some of these sorts of interactions where you've got predation and you've got, you know, full phagocytosis and then actual digestion and breakdown that we believe, you know, Lynn Margulis sort of gave us that idea, um, which which we, of course, understand to be true, um, that this has been an, you know, incredibly important process in, in the in the origin of, of complex life and eukaryotic cells. So it's just a just a fascinating example mm. um, of influences on morphogenesis and on these mm. other, you know, major evolutionary transitions. Yeah, amazing. Um, <clears throat> does anybody does anybody use these bacteria as a vector to manipulate, like the scientists? I mean, uh, to to manipulate, uh, like like you know, we had a we had a story about uh, some commensal bacteria in our planaria that if you if you mess with the relative proportions of the species, you get worms mm -hmm. with two heads with different visual systems. You get all sorts of stuff. Like it wow, seems yeah. like that might be, it seems like that might be a cool vector for uh, implementing some of these changes, you know? Yeah. I'm not aware of any work like that. That's a really incredible example though. And was that something that you just sort of, it was an accident initially, you weren't culturing those bacteria or you were. Uh, the bacteria are hard to culture. This was, this was some work with uh, Ben Wolf, who's a microbiologist in our department. And it started by just asking the question of like, what kind of microbiome lives on these guys. And then we identified mm -hmm. a, few, a few major yeah. types. And then we just said, okay, what, what happens if you over-represent some of them? Mm -hmm. And there was one particular kind that just, just just made all these changes in the in the planaria that the, you know that was housing them yeah no that's that's incredible stuff yeah i'm not aware of any work of that kind but we could definitely you know delve into into the literature and see if we can find anything that's similar i mean my understanding is that we don't necessarily know in a lot of cases again what are the the actual functional molecules that are involved a lot of these have been difficult systems to study in the lab so most of what we know is again based on just culturing um back you know just basic studies of the microbiome um of these organisms and there is this um identification of an ob obligate relationship but not necessarily what molecules are involved and similarly with with the galls as you know you know there, there are there are lots of ideas about what's actually going on there and there's some really really fascinating stuff like it's essentially in some cases at least there's the induction of 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 meristem tissue, it's like mm -hmm. transition of leaf tissue into 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 meristem tissue, which is basically you know it's stem cells, right? So it's pluripotent tissue that can um, that can take on you know various different configurations, but kind of similar things that are going on when the plant is engaged in in you know either fruit formation or flower formation um, or the formation of, of basically of reproductive organs. Um, so in some cases you've got organism, you've got uh, invertebrates which have uh, are expressing things which look a lot like plant hormones and they look a lot like plant reproductive hormones. Um, but then in other cases it looks like and maybe these are two, these are perhaps you know the, the same process viewed at different timescales or at different stages of evolution. But you can there is um, in at least one uh, in an aphid. No, is it in an aphid or in a wasp? Sorry. Um, they have shown that, well, they believe that it's a, um, I think it's a wasp actually, a, uh, it's a hormone that's involved in um, ovum formation within the wasp lineage itself, right? So it's a repurposed, um, so it's obviously similar enough to whatever is, is what the plant hormones, these wasp hormones, they can induce a similar effect with a few different, a few small modifications. And I mean, that's what we see all the time with uh, with with toxins, um, which are again more my my area of specialization, um, is that you you know you get a what I call an endophysiologically active molecule, you know something that's got some key regulatory function in the body of the organism that produces it, um, but it has a, a particular kind of activity that can readily be repurposed as a toxin. Uh, so like a not you know a, a really straightforward example is uh, a coagulation factor. So certain snakes have directly recruited um, coagulation factors into their venom, modified them a little bit, um, and then so now they're kind of like hypercoagulation factors. And when they inject them into target organisms, it just starts clotting the blood and chewing up 
um, the organism's endogenous co coagulation factors at a very increased rate. Um, but something similar probably going on basically is what I'm saying with, with the ghouls in the sense that you've got something that's involved in, in the induction of specific forms of tissue or, uh, you know, in, in morphogenetic processes in the producing organism, and then it's repurposed to do something very similar in the target organism. Yeah. Um, are, are, are you aware of any, uh, is there any overlap between the examples that you gave, the kind of the, the developmental <clears throat> control and compounds that are known to be psychoactive? Is, is there any, uh, any intersection there? Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah, that's a really, a really interesting question, though. Um, and maybe you'd be specifically thinking of things that are sort of plastogenic, right? Um, for, so for, neuro, neuroplastogens. For, for example, in plastogens, uh, just, just the, like, like a lot of our work has been around tr treating the development, uh, but morphogenesis more broadly as mm. the behavior of a collective intelligence and morphism. Yeah. And once you yeah. view it as behavior, you can, you can start to use all the tools from, from neuroscience, right? And so mm -hmm. we've done all kinds of uh, things, but, but one of the things that I really would like to do, and we're still, we like, we don't have the reagents yet because a lot of these are scheduled substances. So, but, but um, you can, I, I would like to, you know, I, I want, the, I want the collective intelligence to hallucinate. And so mm -hmm. like we've tried, we've tried SSRIs and, mm -hmm. and are quite interesting, actually, uh, mm -hmm. sort of serotonergic modulators. We've done, we've done some other drugs that aren't scheduled that are kind of a little bit in that category. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. I mean, I've seen, I've seen embryos that aren't quite sure what species they're supposed to be. And they make some things that belong to it, to an entirely different, you know, entirely different species and things like that. Uh, but, but we, and we haven't even gotten to the good stuff really great. We don't have, yeah. So, yeah, are you so, are you seeking approval to work with some of the the more tightly controlled substances? Uh, I haven't started the process yet. I need to figure mm. out like exactly what that entails mm. and mm. and uh, how much of that we're actually going to be able to do. But you know, I wonder. I mean, and so and and another thing I'd love to hear you talk about is this issue of like, isn't it amazing that it's always it's always struck me as as interesting, and maybe you can you can um, say a little bit about it how life forms that are very um love split off from us a really long time ago so you know mm -hmm. like 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 you know mushrooms you know and things mm -hmm. like this that that they just they they happen to have these molecules that are a very nice fit into some receptors in a vertebrate brain and they don't kill you they but but they do make mm -hmm. you so they, like what's up mm -hmm. with that why why is it that why is it that uh, that these you know fungi have uh, such a subtle, you know, they have these molecules that are like, like a, such a, such a subtle effect on, on, on an animal that didn't exist for the longest time. Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. And I mean, I think the broader question about the, the prevalence of, of psychoactive molecules in, you know, in, in plants and, and fungi in particular, it's, it's still a little bit mysterious on, on, on one level. Like in many cases, we just don't know what these molecules do in the plants or fungi's normal ecology or whether they have regulatory functions in 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 mm. you know again in the in the molecular economy of the organisms that produce them or they are specialized i say exochemicals right they have an exo like outside special uh function that's directed outside i mean a lot of them might make sense and not everybody likes this just connection and it may trivialize them in some sense but as toxins in the sense that they might serve to, you know, disorient or confuse or, or you know, um, a toxin again doesn't necessarily, it's just a, a chemical that's mediating an antagonistic interaction. It doesn't necessarily have to kill or, or even make sick. It just it can be a deterrent. And so it is possible that some of these molecules are just, you know, deterrents for, for certain kinds of um, of potential predators. And I mean, there are obvious examples, not necessarily psychoactive, but something like capsaicin in chilies, um, which is specifically a deterrent for mammals because they have, you know, these trip V1 pain receptors in their in their mouths, um, whereas birds don't have them. Um, so birds are, you know, so the hypothesis goes, birds are better um, dispersers for chili, for the fruit and the seeds. Um, Mammals, on the other hand, like maybe destroy whole plants and just aren't good dispersers for chilies. So they specifically 
are a defensive toxin for mammals. But weird things happen, right, when a certain, you know, mammal, a certain naked ape decides that they enjoy a little bit of pain um, and starts to to cultivate chilies. And you get this, this is the kind of flipping of the valence of a, of a you know, chemical e ecological interaction from something that's antagonistic. So a defensive toxin becomes now a target molecule that humans are cultivating and now chilies are all over the or all over the planet you know so it turns out that this positive relationship with a particular mammal has has been very good for the evolutionary history of the chili and that's something that we see with a lot of plants well a number of plants and fungi that make psychoactive molecules as well right you know um you know cannabis has a global distribution and you know some people claim that there's no uh, there are no cannabis sativa plants in the world that are descended from, you know, genuinely wild stock. So it's all, you know, the product of a history of, of domestication, you know, poppies, even psilocybe producing fungi, you know, are found everywhere in the world. And, and some of that at least is, is humans having spread it either, you know, intentionally or, or accidentally. Um, but yeah, what the, what these, they might be secondary metabolites, which is essentially just means we don't know what they do. Um, in the, uh, they're not part of the of the, you know, they don't have a core regulatory function, so they probably have some externally oriented function, maybe in deterrence, uh, some form of signaling. Uh, so they are signaling molecules, perhaps, and a, and a toxin is a kind of signaling molecule, right? Um, and often toxins target signaling pathways, and so you know you get neurotoxins of all sorts in in all, all sorts of venomous and poisonous animals um, that target very specific receptors um, in in invertebrates or invertebrates. Um, and obviously, you can understand in in a kind of antagonistic coevolutionary um, or or indeed a, a mutualist situation why there would be this tight relationship between, say, toxin and target, or um, or you know just uh, you know any molecule and its target molecule, its its sort of selected interaction partner. But why we get these apparently contingent effects? Well, again, it may be that we are just the 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 bycatch or the, you know, we're caught in the crossfire of some interaction. So maybe there's been a kind of an evolutionary arms race between, um, you know, fungi that produce molecules like psilocybin and certain invertebrates for a long time. And certainly invertebrates have, you know, serotonin and, and you know, very and similar receptors to us. Because a lot of these, these as you know very well, you know, a lot of these core signaling pathways and, and, and other molecular pathways are just incredibly conserved. Um, they've been around for, for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and so maybe, you know, it's it's aiming to have one effect on a common predator, say, of, of the fruiting bodies of the mushroom, something that, you know, maybe disrupts the, the, the spore distribution of mushrooms. Maybe it's mammals, you know, maybe specifically they're trying to deter mammals for, who eat entire fruiting bodies and um, take all the spores with them so they don't get dispersed properly. Um, and then, you know, that basic, you know, function of disorienting and confusing and all of that sort of stuff turns out to be something that under certain circumstances is actually I don't, insight generating, you know, because it's breaking your frames of reference, right, which is potentially terrifying. Um, uh, suddenly, you know, all of your, your, you know, meaningful information is all turned upside down. That's very potentially alarming, but it could also be very, very useful, right? Um, so, that's pretty vague and hand wavy all that I'm saying there, but I don't think we have a really good understanding of of what uh, selection pressures have really led to the shaping of these things beyond the fact that there are these just incredibly conserved pathways um, across the tree of life. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, it always seemed to me, you know, <laughs> mushrooms. It's it's very easy for them to kill you in the way through microtubule, to, uh -huh. or, you know, or to disrupting aging, right? And and those things are conserved like wide, right? Yeah. Extremely wide. Yeah. Right? So, so that's pretty true. That's pretty trivial. You know, if you wanted to kill mm. kill the kill the the um uh, the predator easy enough, uh, the question mm. is like, you know, how, how do you get these super subtle kinds of things, which you know you've, you've spoken to? I think yeah, I think I think it's I think it's really really interesting and um yeah we'll see we'll see what what we can what we can get hold of you know in terms of yeah sort of experiment i think in terms in terms of killing versus teaching let's say um 
you know that that's been a, a persistent discussion in you know toxinology circles studying just defensive toxins in general you know um and even you know including defensive venoms you know and and it gets in into discussions of mimicry amongst like snake complexes <clears throat> you know where you have snakes that are obvious mimics of each other and one has a potentially fatal but not particularly painful bite and the other one has a highly painful um you know they're both venomous but the other one has a highly painful but not as likely to be fatal bite to something like a human or a large mammalian predator um you know some people argue which which is the actual model and which is the mimic you know yeah, yeah. Where, where does more where does more learning occur um in terms of how what's what's the best deterrence is it just killing the animal that that interferes with you um i mean there's going to be lineage level learning obviously if you if you just kill organisms that interact with wh whatever the uh you know the the poisonous organism is um but it actually might be it's an alternate pathway and we can't say one is better than the other but it might be equally as good to not kill but to induce some profound learning in that organism um and I mean, you could even speculate, especially if you were targeting a social organism in some way, you know, if you can teach an individual, they can go and teach all the others, hey, you know, better avoid those. Mm -hmm. we, we don't, I mean, there are so many things that can be going on and there are so many contingencies in why different organisms are, um, you know, ultimately developing different uh, functions for their toxins that it's it's going to be really, really hard to disentangle all of those sorts of things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. interesting. Well, I think, I mean, just just right there with nothing else, I think we have a very interesting uh, set of stories to tell people about this 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 notion of um, you know broader, but also specifically developmental uh, and morphogenetic hacking via you know and how and how it is that uh, that in nature these things get explored and picked up and and so on. Um, you know, and then I could I could talk about the you know some of the implications for for morphogenic engineering and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be cool uh, for for the paper uh, to go through just a bunch of different you know exactly. chemical ecology type interactions exactly. from again these mutualisms to to uh, to various forms of um, of antagonism, etc., and then how these things can shift over, and just basically how organisms disrupt or manip manipulate each other's physiology or metabolism um, and sort of reorient the att attracting set, essentially. Um, I mean, that's where it gets really fine um, and elegant, right, where we're not just killing, we're not just disrupting the thing to, you know, spiral it out of control and, you know, unto death, but actually installing new set points yeah. um so sh shifting the organism's you know biomolecular economy the way it's managed the um the attractors that various homeuretic flows are, are under the influence of like actually shifting them somewhere else and and what makes that cool is that that just immediately brings us into line with what we're intending to do with any molecular tool like a drug right yeah um we're basically saying that this system is under the influence of some pathological set of attractors um and this become very clear in a kind of you know dynamical systems treatment of um of mental health disorders um like dynamical systems perspective on mental health disorders it's under the influence of some uh, you know aberrant set of attractors i.e stuck in a rut um and we are trying to with a targeted pharmacological intervention mm -hmm. trying to shift it out of um, out of that rut, and then you have a comparison there at that level between things like um, sort of you know psychotropic medications, things like SSRIs, which you mentioned, and maybe ADHD medication and things like that, where there's chronic medication, where the underlying principle is that we we you know again we've got this pathological state and we're going to slowly and sh force the whole system into what we think is a is a healthy normal state or you've got disruptive pharmacology where when you speak of things like psychedelic therapies and that sort of stuff really the only idea there is to sh is to just you know disrupt that habitual pattern that habitual pathological pattern and give the system an opportunity to reconstitute itself uh to recanalize itself um in relation to some you know healthier uh set of attractor states right mm. um so it, there are two fundamentally different paradigms there about the way that we that we use drugs and one one is it's not really micromanaging um to use some of the you know the terms that you that you uh that you often use 
it's not really micromanaging, but it is kind of assuming with psychotropic medication that we know that it's, you know, we're going to be able to force this system, um, uh, you know, under the constant influence of the of the exogenous chemical of the drug into a healthier state. Whereas with the disruptive uh, mode, there's none of that micromanaging. There's giving the thing an opportunity. It's just giving it a leg up in some sense, giving it an opportunity to reconstitute itself. And obviously, that's where the importance of psychotherapy and 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 you know setting the the, the rails in a different way um, becomes becomes so important. But, you know, one of the things to go, all, you know, kind of right back to the beginning, you know, one of the things where I think we can we can start with 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 this first paper um, is talking about so kind of mapping your multi scale competence architecture um, against what I have been thinking about for a long time as sort of a layered ecology of molecules. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got we've got chemical ecology, and that describes interactions kind of at one level, like that's between organisms meeting each other's, uh, you know, mediating their interactions with 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 molecular means, as, we, as we've discussed. Um, but you've also got all these other levels, you've also I mean, in terms of ecology, in terms of context specificity, you've got everything from from you know protein folding right at the bottom um, to protein protein or just you know molecular interactions, not necessarily proteins, but often proteins, um, protein protein interactions which take place in a certain ecology of the molecules themselves. You know molecules need to encounter appropriate interaction partners to have activities at all and to have selectable functions. And then you got you get into cell cell interactions. And so those can be within the bodies of, of organisms. So the, the ecology of the, the organism itself or the, the internal <clears throat> ecology of the organism, the cellular ecology there. Um, and then you've got, you know, organism as ecosystem in an extended manner with the, with the holobiont. So you can bring the symbiotic story in and all of these other, you know, non, in our case, non-human cells that are contributing their molecules, their, their chemicals to our internal molecular economy or ecology. Um, and then you've got organism, organism, like whole organism, whole organism interaction. So you're at the traditional level of chemical ecology then, but you've already built up three or four levels before you get to that. And then, of course, you've got uh, really fascinating things like the way cultures can set contexts for the usage of drugs and 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 have a huge impact on the effect that drugs have. Mm -hmm. So even getting into sort of Leary's set and setting, but, you know, mindset, but also cultural context mm -hmm. has a big impact on, on, you know, what a drug ends up doing for, for somebody. Um, and that can actually take you into, I know you like to quote Fabrizio Benedetti um, and, you know, drugs and words having the same mechanisms of action. You can get into the way that um, the words or the narrative surrounding a particular drug uh, actually have a very significant uh, effect on, 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 on what it does to, mm. what it does to people. Mm. Um, and that, that takes us into discussion of addiction and all sorts of things, you know, yeah. the relationship uh, between you know stigmatization of a certain subject and uh, the likelihood that people develop unhealthy relationships with it and all of that sort of thing, but I think you know for the for the if we're doing the the the, the multiple paper outline that we originally had, if we nested in this multi layered you know introduce that initially and then focus on chemical ecology in that first paper and then we can discuss. Um, other levels and you know some of your interests in um, neuropharmacology and and. Um, you know, drug assisted psychotherapy and that sort of stuff a little bit later on. But the other thing we were going to discuss in the middle is the origins of novelty. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's another area that mm -hmm. these things dovetail in really interesting ways. Um, because, well, we can, we can get into it, but there are similarities between the way an organism um, discovers and appropriates a molecular tool and actually changes again balances of relationships change but actual functions change there's a form of exaptation going on there mm -hmm. in which you know a molecule which has a particular selective history for a particular function is appropriated for some other function in the life history of a completely different organism um but there are there are because of the the connection with exaptation but also lots of other fun things um which we can connect maybe to xenobots and anthrobots if you want to go there um uh, there are similarities between that change of context being related to a change of activity and function 
um, with origins of novelty at the molecular level in general, and maybe again, even the the origins of novelty in terms of things like the xenobots. Mm, mm. Yeah, fa fa fantastic. I, I I love that outline. Uh, it, it just occurred to me as you were saying it. I wonder I wonder if we could get uh, the the bots to uh, appropriate some toxins from something else, uh -huh. right? Could, yeah. we, could, could we could we could we you know would they would they take some of the stuff? Um, <laughs> Interesting. Another, you know, another another concept that we've been playing with more recently is uh, this idea of agential interventions. So mm. this this notion that there has to be a kind of impedance match between the tool you're using and the complexity of what you're trying to change. So if you really want to hit these, mm. these high level kinds of system, um, the, the decisions that the physiological networks make and so on, that may be what you want is something also that's a little bit complex and context sensitive. So we've been looking at, you know, anthrobots as, as, um, as treatments and because, you know, on the theory that they, they, they share a lot of priors with the mm -hmm. body itself. Mm -hmm. They, mm -hmm. they have the ability to do complex things that individual molecules may not be able to do. Uh, and, and that they, you know, they come with all these sensors and amplification machinery and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. So that's that also I think is something that we can talk about is all in all of the different examples that you show how much uh, basically to look at it from the perspective of the different elements of the system, including the the compounds, and asking what does the you know what what does the world look like if you're the mm. toxin and, mm. and and what are you able mm. to do right do you you know how much you know, how much action are you able to you know to do by yourself. Yeah. Well, when I was out, when I think of this multi-leveled ecology, which I sort of very briefly outlined, then I am thinking about you know something we we also talked about you know a couple of years ago now I suppose, and we talked very briefly. I had a chat with Maxwell Ramstead about it, and we briefly there was an email exchange with Carl. Um, is that at each of these levels we're speaking when we're speaking of ecology we're speaking of this context specific interactions there is a there is a potentially a free energy principle account of what's going on at each of those levels um that can then be that can then be built up and i think that would be a really uh, potentially it's probably a separate thing from the papers that we're talking about but um it might be something that we can gesture towards in in those papers and then uh, maybe you know bring those guys in if they're still interested and and do a more detailed account of it um yeah so one of the things that that i want to have a quick chat about which this origins of novelty uh discussion because we, we had it a couple of times via email but in terms of the of the of the xenobots or anthrobots yeah. and your um your notion that they are they're essentially escaping from the constraints um of of the you know of the, the cellular networks that they're normally involved in when they're becoming a normal skin cell, and they're they're liberated <clears throat> from those constraint functions, and so suddenly they are uh, they have the capacity to to uh, embody a phenotype which is never before seen in the history of, of of evolution. And I think that they're they're a really vivid example of that. But I actually think that that's kind of a generic process. Um, in the sense that we, you know we have these models in you know so in organism in organismal evolution we have escape and radiate, and in um, molecular evolution we have escape from adaptive conflict, um, and there are ways that these I mean obviously they sound very similar that they are very similar although these analogies haven't been made all that much I've made them a bit but um, so you know escape and radiate very briefly is you know an organism in the environment that it's involved in that it has a long history of selection in is involved in all of these different interactions and it's occupying a, a fairly you know a, a defined niche space um, and then when the when the environment changes so when its context changes all of its contextual constraint changes well obviously if the environment changes too much or if its niche space is too narrow if it's too specialized it might just die right um if everything changes too dramatically but we do see these um cases often and invasive species just happen to be a really good model system for this when you take say a toad out of a context where it's got a bunch of you know evolved um interactions with say predators that have toxin resistance all of that kind of stuff and you take them to a new place um all of the constraint functions have changed and there aren't so many predators that can eat them etc they can radiate right that lineage is suddenly um has a reduction of of constraint pressure on it and is is able to diversify more rapidly um and that's again a very brief and not very articulate way of talking about escape and radiate coevolution but it's a common mechanism that is um that is 
pointed to in diversification of, of, of organisms. With escape um, from adaptive conflict, um, the basic idea there is that gene duplication, so it's one of the theories for, for speaking about how um, gene duplication is involved in the origins of novel functions at the molecular level. Um, gene duplication results in redundancy, um, and you've got one of those genes holding down the fort, so to speak, like carrying on the ancestral function. So it's still under the same, you know, selection pressures, same constraints associated with a function that it's, you know, had a long evolutionary history with. But because you've now got redundancy, you've got another copy or maybe many copies. In some cases, we see these incredibly huge um, redundant arrays of genes sometimes. And this is really common with toxins. Um, and there are reasons why toxins are often recruited from these multi-gene families, which is essentially this reason, which is that there's a, a reduction of constraint on the function of each individual member. And so there's a transformation of the fitness landscape, essentially, you can, you can think of it. So think something that was rugged um, for that individual gene um, becomes smooth for a, you know, a network of, or, or a, an array of, of redundant genes. And then where it gets really cool for me or where I've extended, uh, I think, a little bit brought these escape and radiate and escape from adaptive conflict into, into just more direct contact is that when a, when, a, when a gene product is then, so you've got these redundant genes and you've got um, some reduction of constraint there, but when a gene product is then directed outside the body of the organism that produces it, again, its constraints are completely different there. So for example, you go from not wanting to poison yourself by producing too much of this um, gene product to, well, actually maybe producing large quantities of it in very particular tissues. So there's a gene expression, you know, there's a regulatory um, uh, discussion to have here as well. Uh, could be something that is positively selected because, you know, for a toxin, sometimes more is just better. Whereas for something that um, has a, you know, a tightly constrained gene dosage um, uh, requirements within inside the body of the organism that produces it, obviously you can't just, well, there you maybe can't just accumulate, accumulate duplicates without suppressing the um, expression levels of each of them. Otherwise you just end up getting far too much of the gene product. But basically, all of that is just to say that it seems like kind of a similar thing, like with your frog skin cells or your human, the lung cells, right, um, for the anthropods. Um, not that one would ever have predicted that they would have this particular response to that escape from adaptive conflict or, or whatever, but it seems like kind of the same thing, basically. You know, they, they had an ancestral function. They were tightly constrained by, by you know, their, their, their context, their environment. And then having left that context, having been taken out of that context by, by you guys, um, they have suddenly been free freed up to explore other competencies they had that were previously suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that almost gets mapped onto a kind of exaptation story, but, um, you know, change of context equals change of constraint equals, you know, change of phenotype ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I agree with that. I think, I think all that makes a lot of sense. I, um, well, two things. One is, uh, in, in the standard escape and, 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 uh, radiate story, it it takes multiple generations to get out, right? And so, yeah. so I so I think this is this is interesting because what it tells it tells us is that uh, there's actually a tremendous amount that can be done in one, you know, basically in one. It's like it's like with the tadpoles that we had where we put the eyes on the tail and they, they could see fine from those eyes, even though it was the, the eye was connected to the spinal cord, not to the brain. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. didn't, you didn't need multiple rounds of selection to get to, to, you know, to get into this new sensory motor system architecture, like one generation, like it's fine, they can see. So, so that, that plasticity, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that that plasticity really potentiates this escape and radiate thing. If you were already capable of doing that out of the box, mm -hmm. then of course, put that together with rounds of, of generations like that's yeah you know, the the well, other I thing would, yeah go ahead well just just to say that it, it because it's a particularly vivid example of a plasticity whereas maybe with something like a toad um you, you're not seeing this <clears throat> morph morphological change although there, there are changes in morphology um in in some of the australian populations of toads for example but you're not necessarily seeing that immediately but you are seeing a total change of behavior straight away mm. like straight away so instead of being more cryptic because you're worried that the, you know your environment is full of predators that might feed on you well suddenly there can be selection on boldness you know now you might be a you might be foraging you know at different times of the day um 
juvenile toads in Australia can be can be diurnal, um, and that's really helpful for them because they're avoiding predation from adult toads, which are nocturnal, which are now have become the most significant toxin resistant predator in their environment. Whereas in an environment where there are tons of you know potentially you know diurnal predators that could feed on on juvenile toads, they might be constrained in that way. So you would see, and and we could tell similar stories at the, at the molecular level in terms of, you know, now you can suddenly bind and, um, and you know, occlude a certain receptor, which if you did too much of that within the body, you know, of the organism that produces it, it would have this autotoxic effect. So I think that the there are, there are similarities with immediate shifts in at least behavioral phenotypes when you're talking about organisms. Um, it, it may not seem as vivid, um, but I think it's still it's still similar. Like it's not necessarily yeah. something that that takes dozens of generations or whatever yeah. to happen. But sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, that's 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 great. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, and the only other thing I was going to say is which which I didn't know this the last time we talked. So this is kind of new new data, which yeah. is that we asked the and this this we, we're in the process of writing this up. So there'll be a preprint on it. I don't know in a month or so. Uh, but we asked the question of what genes do xenobots express and, and anthropods mm -hmm. express that the normal mm -hmm. cells don't express. So what new genes are they turning on that, that normal embryos on the one hand and normal lung tissue on the other hand doesn't express? Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of new genes for their new lifestyle you know, mm -hmm. that are, that are yeah, being, that's really... being triggered. And again, no, so no, no trans genes. We didn't put, we had no drugs, no, no, nothing. Just, just as a slightly new lifestyle. Uh, say even the medium is the same, you know, same, same, yeah. really, there's literally very little in the environment that's different, but they, but they are in a different configuration now and their behavior is different. And now they're dipping into the, to the genome to pull out a whole other transcriptional is, you know, set of transcriptional programs, um, some very interesting stuff there. Yeah, that's incredible. And I mean, you have that other example with the the barium exposure of the planaria, right, where they where they did something, I mean, it's, it's different, but similar in the sense that they very yeah, rapidly yeah. Um, changed <clears throat> their gene expression. And, and I think and I think this is the way that you would frame it, you are, you're revealing a plasticity, which might be much more generic than we normally imagine it to be and there are going to be other examples which we can and we you know we're talking about drugs and toxins so we can look at the way that an exogenous molecule dramatically and rapidly changes the gene expression of the of the target organism mm. and you know you can talk about that in in there'll be great examples from like parasites and things like that and um obviously you know we can talk about zombie ants and all sorts of fun things like that you know but you can talk about um parasitoid wasps that inject eggs and various you know toxins or effector molecules that change the immune system like immediately change the immune system and change patterns of gene expression in the immune system of the organisms that they're injected into or you can just talk about like drinking alcohol and how that affects patterns of gene expression over a 12-hour period or something yeah. right so yeah. um there, there are I'm absolutely not undermining the uniqueness and it, of the of the of the, the xenobots and the anthropods but i think what they're pointing to they're just an incredibly vivid example of processes yeah. which actually turn out to be much more more generic yeah. and so people don't necessarily think about a hangover as associated with changes of gene expression in the brain but but it is you know yeah. um yeah. partly that's part of what's going on there why are you why are you so sensitive to light and all of that when you if you know if you wake up and why can't you get back to sleep? You know, you, you pass out. Uh, I mean, not you, Mike. Um, not us. Not us sensible, uh, you know, mature adults. But, you know, one who has drunk too much and passes out and then wakes up early in the morning feeling really wired and can't go to sleep. Well, this, you know, you, you've had a sort of glutamate suppression effect when you've drunk too much alcohol and you've had a, a change in gene expression in, so in glutamatergic pathways in order to compensate from, for that um, effect on gene expression. And now suddenly when you glutamate suppression, well, the alcohol is gone. So glutamate suppression is over, but you've upregulated, um, say, glutamate receptors. Um, suddenly you've got an excess. You've got, uh, you know, you, your glutamatergic activity is peaking in an unhealthy way. And that's because there's been this co compensatory swing in your in your gene expression. So, and I mean, those sorts of things, that's just another vivid example of something that's just going on all the time, you know, like the way that things we put in our body or behaviors we engage in, things we perceive are changing our gene expression at, you know, from from you know very fine grain levels to to quite profound ones um mm. so yeah they, they just feel like incredible model systems that you've got for for uh, uncovering those sort of underlying generic mechanisms mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 uh, I see it. Um, yeah, super cool. Well, I think, uh, I, I th yeah, I, th I mean, this this content that we are, we've outlined is is amazing. I guess the question is, do do we already uh, do we already have a specific outline of all this, or should we or should we make one? I mean, I've been taking notes we, here, but yeah, we have an outline, uh, but it's an old one, um, and I think. I mean, I think it's it's certainly you know enough and suitable for us to work from. But if you've got more notes, and obviously we've got this recording that we can that we can refer to, yeah. there's, are there any particular thoughts that have come up on on the basis of this? We should just incorporate them. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, I I, I kind of see it as the original outline was just you know chemical ecology and your framework and how they they like so, sort of classic chemical ecology and and your framework and how they are you know conceptually there are all of these these fantastic resonances and this you know layered ecology layered ecologies um that molecules you know that we can use um to to understand molecules through like we need to have this layered perspective in order to understand even why a molecule looks the way it is in evolutionary terms that's kind of a, something we haven't really talked about but i think we can introduce that um, and maybe the, the the potential free energy principle connections there in the in the initial um, article, whilst making these um, uh, analogies, well, just showing the resonances between chemical ecology and the work that you've been doing. And then the next article was going to be more focused on origins of novel functions. Mm. So, so one of one of the things we just talk about in passing in the first article is is you know molecular tools and how molecular tools are are discovered, uh, you know, and derived. Um, and then the, the 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 second paper can be talking about origins of novelty, kind of broadly, but using um, molecular tools and things like toxin sequestration and just change of context equaling you know these kinds of analogies between escape and radiate, escape from adaptive conflict, and and things that are going on with xenobots and uh, and anthrobots could be the second paper, and then the third paper was going to be um, more on the way these things. Um, the way the rubber might hit the, the 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 road in terms of integrating this somatic psychiatry perspective, mm -hmm. you know, or take how how is this interaction between chemical ecology and your work, um, and your work is defined as you know somatic psychiatry feeding back into actual psychiatry to some mm -hmm. extent, you know, what 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 are we learning about some of these mechanisms from recognizing the 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 resonances um at these different levels of description um that could potentially be useful for a for a, a treatment of um well a treatment in both senses i suppose like for taking a perspective on mental health disorders but also thinking about the way that we that we actually treat them i like that a lot yeah 